my name is Mara, and welcome to Books Like Whoa. Okay guys, Mission Marple rolls on, third installment here, and today we have none other than The Body in the Library by Agatha Christie. Now, a couple of disclaimers that I always give at the beginning of, of one of these review videos. So uh, Mission Marple is what I would consider to be mostly a spoiler-free review of all of the Marple books that I am rereading in chronological order. This is the third one, it's where we're at so far in the project. And when I say spoiler-free, here's what I mean. I'm gonna take you in a plot synopsis up roundabouts to where we find a body, or usually in Agatha Christie where we find the first body, because bitch is savage. I will talk about character details and I will also get into some thematic analysis, but I don't, my goal in all of these is that the first part of the video should be kind of something that would whet the appetite of somebody who has not read this before and I, my goal is to not diminish the enjoyment of the book for somebody who hasn't read it yet. That being said, um, at the end of that section, I will let you guys know that I am transitioning into a spoiler section. And at that point, I will feel free to spoil any book in the Christie canon. So Poirot, Tommy and Tuppence, standalones, whatever I want to talk about, I will talk about. So I will let you know when that happens. Um, but with all that being said, let's get into the plot synopsis for The Body in the Library, which won't take very long because this is actually like one of the shortest uh, Christie novels that there is, I think. Okay, so uh, The Body in the Library is very much in the same spirit as The Murder at the Vicarage in that in the title, get a pretty clear idea of what happens in this book because uh, we open in Gossington Hall with the delightful, the amazing Dolly Bantry slowly awakening from slumber in a dream where the vicar was giving out a bunch of prizes in church for I think like a cooking show or a plant, I forget if it's like a gardening show, whatever it is. And she slowly awakened to uh, the maid screaming and rushing in and telling her that there is a dead body in the library of their big fancy house, Gossington Hall. So she like wakes up her husband, Arthur, who is the Colonel, Colonel Bantry, and it's like, hey, the maid says that there's somebody dead in the library and there's an amazingly, delightfully comedic exchange about how that can't possibly be true. And then he kind of goes down and lo and behold, yes, there is a dead girl in their library uh, who neither of them know, at least that's what they say. And she's like a platinum blonde and she's just sprawled out in the library. So what does, <laughs> what does the amazing Dolly Bantry do? Does she immediately call the police? No. At the scandalously early hour of 7 45 a.m she calls our main gal miss marple because she's like jane marple knows how to solve a crime like she she was at that long ass dinner party in the 13 problems she knows that if there's anybody around her that is going to know how to like get shit done and figure out who done it and who this person is and all of that it's going to be jane marple so she immediately calls her there's i love all of the dynamic around this because because basically Arthur's like, oh, she just want, you know, she's shocked and she wants another woman with her. And like Dolly Bantry is kind of actually pretty heartless about this. And she's just like, ooh, spicy. Like I'm in the middle of a murder mystery. This is going to be so fun. So Jane Marple shows up. And then eventually, of course, the police are called. We've got stupid Colonel Melchett and Inspector Slack back on the scene and some other people. Eventually they're smart and they call in Henry Clithering, who we like a lot better. I love Henry Clithering. And they're trying to figure out who this is. You know, again, Colonel Bantry says like, I don't know who this is. Everybody's essentially assuming that this is his lover and that he's killed her. Like that's sort of what the town gossip is throughout the book. Um, so we're we're not sure if that's what's happening. Miss Marple does not think that's what happened. She believes him. He spends a lot of time moping around with his pigs, taking care of them in this book. Um, but eventually they come to figure out that there is a girl who works at a nearby resort who has gone missing and that this is presumably her. They go to, I think it's called the Majestic and her cousin also works there. They basically work, you know, like in Dirty Dancing, Patrick Swayze and the lady that he's good friends with, like their job at that that in the Catskills Resort that they work at. It's basically that job, but in a made up version of Bournemouth in England. So they're both sort of like ballroom dancing and like bridge hostesses. Like they just kind of like help the guests settle in and keep them company and stuff. So um, her name's Josie Turner and she got her cousin that job um, and her cousin's name is Ruby Keen. So she goes to the house and she identifies the body. 
So they know it's Ruby Keen and they kind of go from there. And I think I'll just at this point then just give you a quick recap of some of the other characters. So Ruby Keen had gotten really close to one of the guests at the hotel named Conway Jefferson, I believe was his name. And he is like a, gaj a gajillionaire, like he's super rich. And he had he had two children and a wife who were all killed in a plane crash that left him paralyzed and they all died. From that, he then has two in-laws. So he has a son-in-law who's married to his daughter who died, and then a daughter-in-law who's married to his son who died. So the three of them are now a little unit. The two in-laws are still dependent on Conway Jefferson, even though he settled a bunch of money on them and in theory they should be fine. Um, he also is getting really close to Ruby Keen. It comes out very quickly that he was viewing her as an adoptive daughter, like he was planning basically to adopt her and kind of like transform her from uh, the hostess that she was into like a society lady and we'll get to that. Um, so we, we've got them happening. We've got film star who is in town or like a producer and his name is Basil. And he has a blonde girlfriend named Dinah who everybody thought might have been. Like he's known to have like cheap blondes around him basically. What a thing to be known for. So eventually, like initially everyone thought like maybe this was Dinah, but it wasn't. Um, so they're around and they're kind of getting questioned about if they knew Ruby Keen and things like that. We've got a shit ton of villagers. So we get a lot of repeats from the murder at the Vicarage, which is great. So we briefly see Lynn and Griselda, their baby is here, which is great. And we see um, the little old bitty brigade. So like Mrs. Price Ridley, Mrs. Hartnell, like that little crew. We see Dr. Haydick. I mean, I already mentioned that we saw um, Melchett and Slack again. Like we get a lot of the old gang back together and there are so many characters like, there are some girl guides who come up. There are other villagers. Like there are a ton of characters in this, but I think that mostly gets you what you need to know for us to talk about this book. So with that being said, let's get into a few themes here. The main thing I wanna talk about is a spoiler. So I will save that to the very end, but let's, let's get into some things that we can discuss without spoiling. So first of all, this was written in 1942 and really there hadn't been any Marple for like a decade. So Agatha Christie took a big long break from Marple, but from, from here on in her career, we're consistently getting some Marple. So it was written in 42, but this has to have been set probably in about 1939, just based on some of the cultural references and the fact that they even have like people at a resort, because if it was 42, like that was in the middle of World War II, people were getting bombed. So like people wouldn't have just been hanging out at a resort. So this is probably written in a, like set in about 1939. I think it's really interesting to just see how much attitudes have changed between the last full novel we got and this one, like, especially when we talk about like, um, kind of some of the overt sexuality stuff that is mentioned in this book. I mean, it's alluded, like, I, I think I said this in The Murder at the Vicarage, that book, essentially the entire subtext is like, who's boning who? And that's not quite what the subtext here is, but there is so much reference to like extramarital sex and divorce and just a lot of things around like relational taboos that are just the way and the tone of it being discussed is so different than the murder at the vicarage. So I think that that's a noticeable kind of like jump. Um, in terms of some of Christie's attitudes. I also, I think I mentioned this in the 13 Problems review, but like I increasingly am looking at the Marple oeuvre as like my primary lens of it being a feminist reading because there is so much to unpack here in terms of gender dynamics. And like, again, we'll get to it more later, but there's one thing I wanna talk about with that. But one thing I can talk about without spoilers is just how masculinity is talked about in this. Like there's, there's so much discussion about what it means to be a real man and like the kind of poo-pooing of Basil, the film producer, and also Raymond Starr, the other like ballroom dancing guy and tennis pro person at the Majestic. Like just the way that they're talked about in contrast with some of the other characters and how their masculinity is discussed. Like it's definitely like interesting. And I don't even know if Christy is doing that directly, but you so clearly see some of her attitudes towards like what it means to be a man and like kind of her attitudes towards how masculinity is being expressed by the time this book is written. So that's really interesting to me. I think class is a huge element of this. And just the way that Ruby Keen is discussed, even by Miss Marple, it's like really pejorative and kind of gross by our standards. Like the subtext of this is contempt for girls who may have had sex outside of marriage, who are not from a genteel class. Like it just is really, that part is kind of icky, especially in contrast to like, so like Miss Marple is not 
elite in the sense of being like she's not living in Gossington Hall. She wasn't living in Old Hall, but she is like kind of in the same line of genteel, respectable, middle, upper middle class woman. Kind of reminds me of the ladies in Cranford, maybe by Elizabeth Gaskell, like that type of um, social status. And just like her kind of underlying contempt for the underclass and how she talks about the servants, like it just really kind of grossed me out, to be honest, is also like Dolly Bantry's sort of delight in some of the kind of things that have to do with, I don't know, I that part like kind of was unsettling to me. And it's very, I mean, this was clear in the Poirot books as well, like kind of what a snob Agatha Christie is, but I think you see it even more in the Marple books because Miss Marple is an insider as opposed to Poirot being an outsider. So she has even like more nuanced snobbery. And because she is our protagonist, it's not undercut in a way that it sometimes is in Poirot. Like sometimes I think in Poirot, you see some level of Agatha Christie being aware that somebody's being a snob, but I don't really get a lot of her self-awareness on that topic in this particular book. So I'm gonna keep my eye on that as the project progresses and we'll see kind of if she, um, develops any in her sensibilities about class but that was a real it's something that really stood out to me in this book and was kind of disturbing to me to be totally honest i guess the only other thing before we get into the spoiler section is just that i think it's really interesting trying to do kind of a historical read of this just because these little saint mary mead and then in this it's i think called danemouth and like the whole little region that miss marple is inhabiting is so insular so like because we're not always like going to london and getting like some more cosmopolitan um characters involved who may be involved in like international affairs or whatever like it just seems almost like suspended in time, which I think might be part of why Miss Marple is so iconically cozy and why I think she is kind of thought of as being even cozier than Poirot because it really is village life that almost seems like it's in a, a snow globe. Um, I mean, like I said, I think we definitely can make some inferences about the development of social attitudes, but I don't think we see a lot of development in terms of just like, comment on history. I mean, it's some of it's there. Like, I'm not saying there, that's completely absent from this book. But I don't know, I just I think I in contrast to the Poirot ones, it's not it doesn't stand out as much, I think. Oh, also, this book has like a weird shout out to Agatha Christie herself, like we break the fourth wall. And there's this kid who collects um, autographs from famous mystery authors, and she is one of them. So Agatha Christie shouts herself out in her own book, which I think is kind of a badass move. I support it. So all that being said, um, I did like I one thing I do want to communicate is that I think that the tone of this is very funny. And this had a very like this was a lot of fun to read. I really enjoyed reading this. So I, I had a good time reading this. And I remember this as being one of my favorite marbles. And I would say that that still holds. So in my three that I've read so far, I would I would put them basically in terms of what I like about them or in terms of ranking, I would put them in order right now. So I would have Murder the Vicar, just still my favorite, five stars. The 13 Problems in second place at 4.5 and The Body of the Library uh, is four stars. So, and it was four stars the first time I read it as well. So um, we'll see how, I've never read The Moving Finger, which is our, our next entry. So we'll see if it disrupts anything. But so far, um, the first three are as, like they're even better than I remember in a lot of ways. And I remember them being my favorite. So I'm gonna be interested to see how I do with the books going forward. But for now, all of these have been great so far. So it's been a really fun project to date. So with that, let me move into one big spoiler thing that I wanna talk about because it was like my abiding takeaway from this book. We gotta talk about the fact that Josie Turner and Mark Gaskell lure a 16 year old to her death to be a substitute for Ruby Keen and that they immolate someone in a car. This book is so savage, like for how, so our reputation, when we think about Marple, we think about her as being very cozy. Like that's always sort of like the reputation of Marple is very cozy. There's nothing cozy about somebody being burned alive in a car or like, I think she was alive, maybe she was dead, but either way, it's just like so savage. And then we get into like, this is what I'm saying about a gender reading of this, because I feel like there's so much supplemented female rage. Like, I'm wondering if Miss Marple's attitude towards Ruby Keen versus Pamela Reed, like I don't like essentially because Ruby Keen, like they specifically call out the fact that Pamela Reed was a virgin, like they, she was like Virgo intacto. And first of all, the whole thing about a high, like just PSA, high, like using a hymen as a test of virginity is such bullshit. And like, it's a whole thing. Read Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski and you will have 
have that myth pierced for you. But anyway, so like that is really gross to me and like kind of the prizing, like the, that gets summoned to the class stuff of like the prizing of this pure innocent girl guide over this like woman who potentially has had sex before, shock horror, and who is of a lower class and has to work and dyes her hair and like all of this stuff. Like, I think that's like really judgmental and gross. And I feel like it colors some of what Jay Marple's commentary on things is. Also the sublimated female rage of Josie Turner in this book is so intense. Like just like the violence that she exhibits and like her overall attitude, I feel like is so interesting. And this gets into what I've been talking about over the last couple books. I think that this, I think maybe the Marple oeuvre is like a testament to Agatha Christie's unexpressed rage as a woman. <laughs> that's my, like, I don't think that's conscious, but that's this reader's response to it. I feel like this is just like a, like a expression of female rage. And I think like it's just shocking to me because we think of these books as so cozy, but it's so violent. We're getting out of the books that I really remember super well right now. Like the first three I had some like concrete memories of. The rest of Marple aside from like a Caribbean mystery and a murder is announced and maybe 450 from Paddington, the rest of them I just sort of have vague memories of. So like I am keeping my eyes open for like how savage this is, how uncozy these are in some ways. I don't know, guys. I was really kind of shocked by how brutal this is. Okay, so I think that will do it for The Body in the Library. Like I said, I really enjoyed this uh, reread. It was very short. So actually, if you have not been following along and just want to give Marple a try, this might be a pretty good one to recommend to people because I don't even know if this is, this is like 200, no, not even in this edition. It's like 160 pages. So it's a pretty easy place to start. And I think it is one of the sort of iconic um, marbles. So definitely would recommend that. Um, and next up we have The Moving Finger, which will be in two weeks from today. And I've never read it before. So I'm excited. I think it's sort of like a poison pen type mystery. I don't know. We'll see how I do with it. So stay tuned for that. Um, but yeah, I think that will do it. Definitely let me know any thoughts that you have about the body in the library below. If you want to join along with the read, um, we've got a community going on Goodreads, the Mission Marble Book Club. So feel free to go join in the forums there. And yeah, I think that will do it. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social means if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below. I think that will do it. Hope you guys are having a really lovely day and I will just talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you.